The Commodore Amiga was first released in 1985 and although the machine and Commodore have long since been gone, the Amiga will never die. For those that may have heard of the machine but never experienced one firsthand, when it arrived in 1985, it absolutely blew away the competition. The Amiga had multitasking and multimedia, four channel sampled audio channels, custom chips and the blitter was capable of moving pixels around the screen at super fast speeds and it was powered by the legendary Motorola 68000, the same chip that many arcade boards use and later on the Sega Genesis. But thanks to competition and questionable management, the classic Amiga as we know it disappeared. But the Amiga lives on thanks to the vibrant community and individuals that continue to breathe new life into the machine. From brand new games that are released almost every month, to new hardware being developed to keep the machine relevant and interesting. Thanks to modern FPGA technology, it's now possible to build accelerator cards, sidecar expansions, and even modern graphics cards that support 1080p HD resolutions. Something like this was only available on emulation such as WinUAE. We've seen modern hardware updates for the Amiga 500, 600 and 1200 that offer faster speeds, USB support, sound cards and the ability to get your Amiga online. But the big box Amigas, such as the 2000, 3000 and 4000 have not fared as well. These machines are a little more specialized and certainly did not sell anywhere near as many units as the mighty A500. But that doesn't mean there hasn't been any developments made on these machines. Sometime back in 2014, Lucas Hartman developed an FPGA-based graphics card specifically for the big box Amiga. Known as the VA2000, it featured high resolutions all the way up to 1080p at 30Hz, and compatibility with existing Amiga technology. It was a Zorro-based card. Zorro is the card bus standard found on the Amiga. Think of it as the Amiga equivalent of ISA or PCI that you'd find on a PC. The VA2000 card was completely open source, which means anyone could build one, write drivers for it, and the schematics were free and available for all. It also came with a micro SD card slot and 32 megabytes of graphics memory, which was the maximum you could find on any graphics card going at the time. The card itself was great and very popular. Anyone who wants to buy a graphics card for a big box Amiga such as a Picasso 2 or a CyberVision 64 will be paying lots of money for the privilege. A cheap open source modern alternative that connects up to flat panel displays all the way up to 1080p is an absolutely great thing. Okay Amiga fans, it's been a long time coming but we are back today with a brand new video and this is a video review of a graphics card that I ended up picking up late last year on the channel but I wanted to wait until all the kind of quirky issues and firmware updates were already out before I really sat down with this card to review it with you guys. This is the MNT ZZ or ZZ9000 retargetable graphics cards for big box Amigas. But Lucas did not stop there. Last year he released the successor to the VA2000, the MNT ZZ9000 and this card is an absolute monster. This graphics card is built with a 7 series FPGA chip and two ARM A9 cores. It also comes with 1GB of onboard DDR3 RAM. Thanks to the ARM cores, all retargetable rendering API calls are accelerated and are lightning fast. The card also comes with an Ethernet port and a USB port. And like before, this card is fully open sourced and easily updatable via firmware, which has already seen numerous updates over the past few months. So let's go ahead and install our ZZ9000 card into our big box Amiga 4000. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up our Amiga 4000 so we can insert the, and I'm going to call it the ZZ9000. I know folks in the UK and Europe are going to say ZZ, but I'm going to say ZZ9000. But as we'll see, this Amiga that I own actually has quite a lot of expansions in it. The first thing we have here is the Xsurf 1000. This is a Ethernet card. And it also has the add-on rapid road module, which provides USB. So this is essentially a combined USB and network card for the Amiga 4000. So that's going to go, that's going to get replaced with the ZZ or ZZ9000, which has both of those features built in. The next card is a Sound Blaster PCI card. And then underneath that is a Voodoo graphics card. Now you're probably wondering how does PC based 
cards work in an Amiga 4000? Well, that's because I'm using a LBOX Mediator 4000D, which allows you to plug in PCI graphics cards into the Amiga. Now, I'm essentially going to replace both of these cards. The sound card, I'm going to essentially just live without because I really prefer Polar Audio over you know, external sound cards. I've, I've tried different ones. I used to have a Sunrise card, which was cool, but at the end of the day, nothing beats Polar Audio, so that's what I'm going to kind of revert back to. So I started removing my cards to make way for the ZZ9000, and I quickly realized I had an issue. One of the best features of the ZZ9000 is the built-in scan doubler. If you've used an RTG graphics card on the Amiga before, you know the biggest issue is the standard 15kHz mode that almost every game and demo users will not be supported using this graphics card. In some instances, the card manufacturer would provide a pass-through cable, but most of the time you'd need to connect up a second RGB monitor capable of handling 15kHz. The ZZ9000 comes with a built-in scan doubler which eliminates this issue altogether. But for this feature to work, you need to connect the small video board that's connected to the ribbon cable to the ZZ9000. The LBOX Mediator PCI card does come with this slot, however, it's used up by the daughter board that comes with the LBOX. So in the end, I needed to remove the Mediator daughter board as well and replace it with the stock A4000 daughter board. This isn't a huge issue, but it's definitely something to be aware of. Now, as of the making of this video, on the MNT store, there is an adapter that will work around this by connecting directly to the Denise socket. However, this would only work on an Amiga 2000 and 3000, as the Denise chip is not a part of the Amiga 4000 and the AGA chipset. So back to the install, once I replaced the original daughter board, fitting the MNT card was simple to do. But if you've never fit in a Zorro card in an Amiga before, the slots can really grip onto the card, and it's important that you install the card correctly. It should almost snap into place, but as always, don't force it. And after reinstalling the Prisma Mega Mix card back into our A4000, we are ready to go. On the back of the Amiga, we can see the ports coming out of the ZZ9000 card. As mentioned, this card will handle all our graphics, Ethernet and USB. The micro SD card is for the boot firmware, which can be updated. Turning on the Amiga, the first thing that is apparent that indeed, all 15kHz modes are being scan doubled. And let me tell you, first impressions look fantastic. I own an Indivision AGA, an ECS, and an OSCC and the MyComSoft FrameMeister, and let me tell you, this display beats them all. It's razor sharp, and I took some 15kHz captures coming directly from the card. But of course, RTG mode is really what you want. Installing the software is simple enough. Make sure that you install Picasso 96 beforehand if you haven't already done so, and just follow the steps. When you reboot your Amiga, you'll automatically be set into a high-res RTG mode. This is a 720p display, and it looks absolutely amazing. The Windows refresh is super fast and snappy, and as a quick test I opened up a bunch of windows, and it was the snappiest desktop I've run on my Amiga outside of the Vampire 2 on my Amiga 600. Resolution switching is also super fast. For example, going from non-interlace to interlace modes in some games or demos usually cause a delay with scan doublers. The worst offender for this has to be the MyComSoft FrameMeister, which literally takes a couple of seconds for the scan doubler to catch up when a new mode is being selected. But on the ZZ9000, it's the fastest I've ever seen. The built-in Ethernet is fantastic as well. Within a few minutes, I had my Amiga 4000 back online and the transfer speeds were great. Coupled with fast image decoding and accelerated graphics APIs, this was slick web browsing on the Amiga. The addition of the onboard Ethernet is a nice touch. For some reason, however, I did have trouble getting USB to work. I'm running on the latest 1.5 firmware and tried a few different USB thumb drives, but none of them would get recognized. When I checked the USB stack software Poseidon, everything seemed to be configured correctly, but still was showing me errors. USB support is still considered experimental, but I do wish this worked for me. This feature is something that I use quite regularly on my previous setup, and for now I can live without it, but hopefully more work will be done here. 
In RTG mode, I did run some 3D games like Quake and Rise of the Triad. Because the card has accelerated API calls, this means that the performance of these games is increased slightly. For example, calls such as Right Chunky Pixels or any other Picasso 96 call can run much faster thanks to the ARM cores on the card. But I do want to stress here, while you will get some improved speeds, do not expect a magic bullet. After all, this Amiga is still running a 68040 class processor and the CPU will be the main bottleneck. But anytime the CPU is requesting a graphics API call, that is handle lightning fast. Things like screen redraws, repaints, moving windows around, bitmap manipulation and other things are as fast as you'll ever get on a graphics card. I do want to stress that this card was not sent to me for review or anything like that. I ended up buying the card myself out of my own money and the cost of the card is 339 euros. And in anyone's book, that is a lot of money to spend, especially if you're into the Amiga. You're very much used to the high cost of buying hardware. But let's think of this another way. If you want to buy a retargetable graphics card for your Amiga and then add on an ethernet card and then add on USB as a third option, you're going to be paying a lot more than the 339 euros for this all-in-one card that does all of those things and it does them exceptionally well, especially on the graphics side where it's some of the absolutely fastest graphics performance I've ever seen. And then coupled with the fact that this card works with modern displays seamlessly. And then on top of that, you get the scan doubler built in as an absolute bonus. Then this is essentially the only card you'll ever need for a big box Amiga. If you're one of these people that used to own an Amiga or, or you still own an Amiga and it's sitting in your attic or your garage and you're not really sure what to do with it, maybe you wanna bring it back and, and turn it back on, but you don't really know how to proceed, then look no further than this card. This is the card that you're looking for. It's going to offer so much cool features and it's going to get you back connected up on a modern display on the internet and really getting you, you know, your productivity-based Amiga back where it needs to be, back in your office, so you can start doing some cool stuff with your Amiga once again. But ultimately, the choice is up to you. I am a big fan of the ZZ9000, and as someone who ended up committing to buy one myself, I would absolutely recommend it if you're thinking about getting your big box Amiga back where it needs to be in 2020, I would say absolutely take a look at this card. You will not be disappointed with the features and the things that it can do. And hopefully you guys got a good sense of that on this video and on the channel. Well guys, we're going to leave it here for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.